OK. So today's lecture is on um, what's called Markov random field matting and something called random walk matting. And so you know, I don't want to, I mean, matting is an important problem, but I don't necessarily want you to think that I am just like so passionate about matting that I want to talk about it all the time. What I do want to talk about, though, is that today we're going to introduce a kind of an important um, optimization framework and an optimization algorithm that is really useful for general computer vision problems. And so it's worth knowing about this algorithm and knowing about how to set it up. Um, okay, so today's topic is Markov random field matting. And you will often see this abbreviated in the literature as MRF. Okay. And so let's keep in mind what do we want when we say we want to make a good map. Okay, well, there are a couple of key things to keep in mind, right? One is, um, so basically, you know, considerations. One is that um, at each pixel, the image should be consistent with the matting equation. Okay, that's for sure. Now we also talked about how, since there are more unknowns than there are constraints, that there are lots of possible maths that still satisfy this equation, and so. The other thing is that we want uh, adjacent values of uh, alpha, f, and b to be similar, except when there's an edge. Right? So. That's like saying, you know, when I have a very smooth region, like this whiteboard behind me, you know, for the most part, I expect that the alpha, alpha values of all these pixels should be more or less the same. However, from your perspective, right, there's a point where the white of the whiteboard transitions into the blue of my shirt. At that point where there's a strong color edge, then I don't necessarily expect that two adjacent pixels are going to have exactly similar alpha values because I know that something has changed in the image, right? So this is kind of the caveat is that in general, we want similar you know, pixels in the same neighborhood. We want pixels in the same neighborhood to have similar alpha values and also similar foreground and background values, okay? And the third thing is that, um, you know, the alpha F and B should be guided by the trimap or by user scribbles, okay? So basically, you know, how do we initialize this whole process? Well, the user has to give me some sort of input where they say, look, I think this is the foreground, this is the background. You figure out the middle ground where the alpha values are fractional, okay? So what we're gonna do today, initially, is set up what's called a energy function, okay? And so, more specifically, it's what's called a Gibbs energy. Don't worry too much about that. But the idea is the following. It's kind of like a cost function, right? So I want this function to be uh, small for a good alpha. And so um, this guy is going to have two parts. So let me just make a little uh, picture of an image grid, right? So there are kind of two parts, right? We imagine that every pixel in the image is a vertex, okay? So pixels are vertices, which I may say there's in some set V. So every one of these dots is a vertex. And then I also have edges that connect the vertices, connect adjacent vertices. And in this case, I'm just drawing like the uh, north, south, east, west neighbors of every vertex. If I wanted to get fancy, I could also look at the diagonal neighbors and so on, but that would make my graph a little bit more messy. And so I also have uh, edges between adjacent pixels.
And so this basically means that over the image pixels, we're forming a graph. Okay, a graph has basically nodes and edges that are connected. And so in this case, I mean, for, for this type of image, the graph is just like supernaturally inherited from the fact that I have these rectangular pixels in this certain structure. And so what do I want to minimize in a matting problem? Well, what I want is that at every vertex, I want to satisfy the matting equation. I'm going to talk about this uh, in just a second, but in general, what I'm going to say is I have one term that only depends on what's happening at every vertex. And that's called a data energy. Okay. This will basically be saying like, how well are we satisfying the Manning equation at every pixel? And then I have another term that says for every edge, for every pair of pixels connected by an edge, I have a, what I'm call a smoothness. Term. Smooth. And so the idea here is that this is going to be a term that kind of enforces similar alphas or similar pixel or adjacent pixels to have similar alphas. Okay. And so we're going to talk now about the specific functional forms of these things for the batting problem. Okay. So any questions so far? And let me just say that. This is a very common setup for computer vision problems in general. A lot of times, you'll find yourself in a situation where you have uh, you know, a bunch of nodes in a graph, you have something that has to happen at each node, and you want to say that there's some sort of consistency between the nodes. And so this Gibbs energy comes up a lot in other problems besides mapping. And in fact, we'll see it again in the context of some of the optical flow stuff we're going to talk about in uh, chapter five. Okay. So, how about this data energy? So the data energy, we want to encapsulate the idea that at any independent pixel, we want the matting equation to be pretty much satisfied. And so that means that we need to have a function that is basically zero when the matting equation is exactly satisfied and gets bigger when the matting equation is not satisfied. And so here's a candidate for how that function might look. So this is basically like a little exponential function. And there's a similarity to something that we, um, tr that we talked about uh, before. So if we think about it, right? So this function here in the exponent is basically getting, you know, this, this thing inside the square is getting bigger and bigger as um, I diverge from the matting equation. When this is zero, when I'm exactly on point with the matting equation, I get e to the zero power is one, and then I have one minus one is zero. So that means that when the matting equation is exactly satisfied, that pixel is adding nothing to the overall energy in the whole image. So that's good, right? So we want when things are good, this energy is zero. When this is very large, then this function, e to the minus some very large positive number is basically zero, and I have one minus zero is one, right? So that means that when the matting equation is totally not satisfied, this cost function is close to one. And so fundamentally, what this looks like is that kind of as a function of, um, you know, it's kind of hard to draw with the x-axis here, you know, um, satisfaction, let's call it, satisfaction of the matting equation. and on this axis I have the data term, then basically when life is good, I'm close to zero, and when life is bad, I am close to one. And this sigma in the exponent basically controls how quickly I get there, right? And so, you know, if I want to be a little bit more generous, maybe I may choose a small sigma. If I want to be, you know, stricter, I choose a large sigma. Okay. All right, so this kind of makes sense. Um, another thing that we might want to do is the smoothest term. And the smoothest term, again, kind of has a similar form. Just a, yes? Just a real quick question on that. So when I 
that satisfies my equation. It's basically true. Is that what you're going for? It's getting closer and closer to one. Well, no, actually, oh, I see. Um, maybe I should call this error in Manning equation. Okay. Sorry. That's the, yes. That's a Good. Confusing. Yeah, so that's, you're right. That was a bad term. So basically, yes, when the error is low, I want the cost to be low. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Other questions? Okay. So what would be a reasonable smoothness energy? So this is like saying that if I and J are similar or are adjacent pixels, then again, I could use a similar thing where I could say one minus e to the sum something like this, right? So again, remember that um, the alphas are always on a scale from zero to one, right? And so here, when the two alphas are exactly the same, then that means that the exponent is zero, I have e to the zero is one, and again, the smoothest energy is zero. When the two alphas are different, like when I have one of them is one and one of them is zero, then this thing becomes large, and you know, the larger it gets, the closer this thing gets to zero. Okay. And again, this sigma s term can be used to tune how quickly I get there. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, there are other candidates for these possible functions, but these are reasonable ones to start. I mean, we could argue about different functions that you could use for this. Okay. And so now my goal is to uh, minimize the sum of this plus that. Okay. So the goal is to minimize, you know, um, basically the whole energy, which is this same thing I had before. So I'm trying to minimize this at every pixel, and I'm trying to also simultaneously get these smoothest terms working. Now, um, let me just say that, um, move my mouse pointer off the screen here. So you could also argue about, you know, um, should these two terms be weighted differently, right? So if I wanted to, again, I could put some sort of a constant in front of the smoothest term to say, okay, well, you know, if I want the smoothest to be a lot more important than the fidelity to the Manning equation, then I would crank that constant way up. Right now, I just made it so that these two terms are equally important, right? But just with the caveat that you could make them differently important if you wanted to. Okay. Question. So, uh, so that smoothness uh, energy term mm -hmm. uh, it seems to say so. If our goal is to minimize the sum of those two, it seems to prefer uh, adjacent pixels having different alphas. Right? It should prefer adjacent pixels to have similar alphas, right? So I want to minimize this, right? So that means I want all these numbers to be close to zero, right? So, well, the, the exponential term there, like alpha i minus alpha d, if they're different, then it should be... Because oh, oh, I have the one minus, right? right? Yes. Right. So that's, it's that's one why. Minus it's one minus that to make sure that I'm <laughs> minimizing instead of maximizing. Right. Okay. So other questions or comments? Okay. So um, how are we going to actually solve this minimization problem, right? So basically what we have to do is we have to solve for the alpha values at every pixel in a way that agrees with this. And actually, I am also sweeping something slightly under the rug here, which is that I also have to understand for every pixel in the data term, where do these foreground and background samples come from, right? Because I don't know the foreground and background either. I'm trying to estimate those on the fly too, right? So I've got a bunch of stuff to estimate. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. Well, let's, so, let's not forget that we have all these user constraints from the scribbles and from the try map, right? That's where the whole problem is kind of seeded from. And so um, let's not forget that in a regular, in a kind of a try map setup, we have, you know, something like this, where all this stuff is known background, let's call this B, all this stuff here is known foreground, and this middle, the middle part is what we don't know, right? And so 
what I could do is I could say, okay, I have some known pixels, which could be like the union of the pixels where, where I see both the foreground and the background. And then the unknown pixels are what I need to estimate the alpha for. Okay. And so one of the you know interesting approaches to solving this Gibbs energy was a algorithm called belief propagation based batting. And this was a uh, paper by a couple guys, Wang and Cohen. Uh, Cohen is at Microsoft. And the idea is to kind of propagate known or estimated alpha values from k into u. And so exactly how does this work? So, so the key term here is belief propagation. Okay? So belief propagation is what I was talking about as this algorithm that is very commonly used in computer vision. Okay? And it's exactly um, set up for this kind of energy function. Okay? Now, to make it easier, so let's just note that um, um, alpha should be continuous, but for the moment, um, let's think of it as discrete. And kind of the way this is going to work is we're going to imagine that every vertex has an evolving kind of probability distribution function for what its alpha should be. So it is that each alpha has an evolving um, probability mass function. And maybe it's easier for me to just sketch what I mean by that. So what I mean is that Let's suppose that I have my alpha range. You know, let's suppose I discretize it in, you know, units of 0 0.05. So basically, I have like, you know, 20 or maybe 21, you know, uh, possible alpha values. And so that's like saying that every vertex, I have kind of a probability distribution going from 0 to 1. And so, for example, at a known foreground pixel, my PDF is always just this, you know, single bar at one, because I know that the alpha there has got to be one, right? Um, but in general, you know, if I have a pixel that is close to the foreground, what I might have is a PDF that looks more like this where, you know, I have a bunch of very low bars here for things that are close to zero. And then as I get closer to one, I have kind of more probability that I'm close to that uh, value. So this would be something that resembles a nearly foreground pixel, right? And so if I saw that histogram, that distribution for a given vertex, and I was forced to make a choice about what the alpha value was, well, then I could do something like I could choose just the highest bar, or I could choose the expected value of the distribution, like the kind of the average value. And so, um, you know, given a PDF for um, alpha at a pixel, you know, can just choose alpha with the highest probability.
or um, you know, or I could take the average value and so on. Okay, so the real question is, so, so the basic setup is that every pixel is going to have its own PDF for its distribution of alpha, okay? And that PDF is going to be evolving over time, okay? And the way that this evolution process works is kind of neat. So basically, it works on what's called the message passing algorithm. And so the idea is that this is an iterative process. At every iteration, you know, I basically solicit from my four neighbors, hey, you know, what do you think my alpha distribution should be? And the neighbors will respond. Each of them is going to give me a distribution. And I'm going to take all of this input from my neighbors. I'm going to look at what I have on my own side. I'm going to think, okay, well, I'm going to use all this information to make a new estimate of what I should be. And then I'm also going to generate new estimates of what I think my neighbors should be. And I'm going to pass this around to my neighbors. And so here's a kind of a crude uh, diagram of kind of what that looks like, right? So here, you know, the shaded bar graph in the middle is basically my current belief of what my alpha distribution should be at pixel i. And then these white bar graphs surrounding my pixel are the messages that each neighbor j is sending to node i in the middle saying, hey, you know, this is what I think your PDF should be. And kind of what's not shown here is, you know, then after these messages are all kind of, you know, synthesized, then node i generates messages that are now going back out to its neighbors. And this process basically keeps on going until all the messages end up converging, which means that at some point, when I get the information from my neighbors about, hey, this is what I think you should be, I'm going to look at it and say, well, that's what I already am. And so eventually, when things stop changing, that's when the algorithm stops. Okay. And so I don't want to go into a lot of details about exactly how this process works, because actually the, the mathematics behind how the message passing works is a little bit advanced. It's in the appendix, appendix A of the book. Um, the other thing that actually makes belief propagation kind of interesting is that um, there's actually really no fundamental guarantee that it works in the sense that, so for those of you that are computer scientists, you probably have done things like trees, right? So you have, you have graphs with nodes and edges that are basically arranged in a, in a tree that has no loops, right? If you do this kind of belief propagation algorithm in a tree where you're passing messages down the tree, you can prove that that will actually converge to the correct you know, PDFs. But in this case, we have an image where the pixels are connected together in, you know, here I kind of have what are called loops, right? So basically, these four pixels together form a circle, right? And so these guys, in theory, are passing messages around this loop an infinite number of times. And it turns out that for this so-called loopy belief propagation, there really aren't the same kind of guarantees about whether it will work at all. But in practice, it works really, really well. And so um, in, in practice, people use it because they know it works. Question in the back. Yeah, so for the pixels that you don't really know anything about, uh, how do you initialize their PDFs to? Good question. Something? Okay, so how do you initialize this? Right? So, so basically, the key question then becomes, how do you initialize the whole process, right? And then you initialize it and you let it run, yeah. okay? So that's exactly where I'm going. Okay, so let's talk about that. How to initialize alpha. Well, keep in mind that there are some fixed pixels that come from the trimap and the scribbles, right? Those guys are known, and their PDFs always look like something like this, right? So no amount of message passing those guys will ever change those guys' minds. They know exactly what they should be. What about the guys that are not known, right? So for alpha um, inside U, kind of the unknown region, you know, again, there are a couple of possibilities. We could use something like, um, you know, we could use something like a delta function at a half, where you're basically saying, well, you know, I'm pretty sure that I'm a half. That may not necessarily be the best idea. Um, maybe a better idea would be something where it's just like a uniform distribution on alpha. This is kind of like saying, well, you know, the pixel is totally agnostic about what its PDF could be, right? Uniform PDF. Um, but there's a smarter way to do it, and the smarter way to do it is kind of the core of this matting algorithm that was proposed. 
Um, a better idea is to uh, obtain uh, an estimate alpha hat, which is kind of like a guess about what alpha should be based on foreground and background samples that are nearby. And so you may remember that I kind of mentioned that this issue of uh, kind of looking at where I am and sampling the foreground and the background, that's kind of an important concept in these matting algorithms. And so how does that really work? So that's kind of like saying, okay, you know, here is my image. And suppose this is like kind of a zoomed in version of the image. So let's suppose that here is my foreground region and here is my background region. And here is a um, pixel in the unknown region that I'm trying to get an estimate for, okay? And so what this guy will do is he will go out looking for, um, you know, some nearby foreground samples and some nearby background samples, okay? So these are basically foreground and background samples near an unknown pixel. Right? So that's what these dots are here. And so kind of what I have is that for every pixel, I have a set of foreground candidates. I'm going to put this in kind of air quotes. So this is saying like, okay, you know, I'm going to look at some M closest foreground samples to my pixel. And I also have some background candidates. Maybe I have a different number of background candidates. And then what I can do is I can say, okay, well, for every, um, you know, for every alpha or for every, I'm sorry, for every pair of candidates uh, I'm running out of letters here let's say A and B kind of a messy notation here so this is like basically saying at pixel I I take one of my foreground candidates one of my background candidates I can estimate um, the value of alpha, that's like saying, okay, at this pixel, you know, I know my color, I'm guessing a foreground, I'm guessing a background, and I can find the alpha that is most consistent with that, right? That's kind of like saying, okay, now I have three equations and only one unknown, which is alpha, right? So that's an equation that I can solve. My color that I have probably is not going to be exactly consistent with the foreground and the background that I choose, but I can find the best alpha that I can, right? And every pair of such samples gives me one possible value of alpha, okay? And now you can imagine that if I took all m times n pairs of foreground and background samples, I would get a bunch of estimates for alpha, and I could use that to build my initial PDF for what the alpha at that pixel should be, okay? That's the general idea. It's expensive, right? So, and actually we're gonna talk about that in just a second. So, yes, that is a little bit expensive to do, right? Um, the other thing that, that I'm kind of sweeping under the rug is that, you know, we also probably want to weight each foreground and background sample, right? In the sense of saying, okay, well, some of these samples may be better than others, right? And in some sense, that's kind of like the secret sauce of different matting algorithms is choosing the right foreground and background samples to give me alpha estimates that I trust, okay? And so, um, you know, for example, Part of the, you know, part of the weighting could come from spatial distance, right? So maybe I want to weight the guys that are closer to me physically with higher weights, as opposed to something where I'm looking at these guys here that are further away, right? That kind of stands to the reason because I'm trying to enforce the fact that I only want to look at nearby data. Um, 
I also probably want to bring in the fact that you know if I am a really different color than the pixel over here, well then maybe I don't want to be using that pixel as a foreground sample because I kind of a priori don't think that it's going to be very similar to me, right? So there's all sorts of little nitpicky nits and pieces for how do I generate the weights on the samples, right? But that's the basic idea. And that's really all I want to convey to you right now is that you ask where the, that, that's the question is where, this, where the initial alphas come from, that's where they come from. Follow up question? Are you okay? Yeah, sort of follow up. So okay. you mentioned that there's no real guarantee that the algorithm will either terminate or give you a good result. Yes. But does it give you a good result with like a high enough probability? Oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, like I said, even though there are no guarantees, in practice, this works like a charm. You know, so, uh, and in fact, there are many, um, there are many algorithms, like for example, there's a kind of a key communication algorithm inside your cell phone for data communication called turbo coding that is based on belief propagation and, you know, it's used all the time and it just works, right? So, uh, yes. So you can be, you could be pretty confident that if you run this algorithm, it will work, right? I mean, it, it, it can fail, but I mean, maybe those are weird corner cases where it fails, right? I know all you computer scientists, you always want guarantees and so on. Okay. Um, so, so that's that's actually the fundamental idea, to the extent that I want to convey it, of these belief propagation ideas. So the, the the basic concept is, for every unknown pixel, I generate some foreground samples, some background samples. I use those to kind of initialize a estimate for the alpha at that pixel, which could take the form of a PDF. Then I take the initial PDFs for all my unknown pixels, the known. PDFs, which are just delta functions at foreground and background samples, and then I turn the crank and I basically keep on turning the crank until things converge. And again, some of the details of how this whole algorithm works are fairly subtle. And so, you know, even there aren't a whole lot of details in the book on every specific algorithm. For that, you kind of have to go to the original research papers and dig in a little bit to find out exactly how they did it. Um, but that's the basic concept. Um, okay. So, let me pause and ask, so any questions about the big picture idea? Now, let me just say, actually, that uh, I didn't prep this, but hopefully it will work. So, let's just look at... Uh, hopefully I'm online here. Okay, so basically, you know, there's a nice uh, web page, the Middlebury... Uh, so Middlebury College actually um, hosts a lot of very nice computer vision resources, evaluation data sets. Remember the Matting, uh, I think the Matting website that I showed you is not actually hosted there, but there are a bunch of, you know, very often used websites or uh, evaluation data sets at Middlebury. So here's a um, MRF minimization kind of package written by, you know, um, some of the top people in the field. And so the nice thing is that they provide code for you know, if you want to do your own, you know, mark of random field minimization, you don't have to write this whole belief propagation algorithm up yourself. And in fact, there are other ways of minimizing these Gibbs energies besides belief propagation when you've got a function that's set up in the same form. And so what these researchers did was they kind of looked a few years ago at, you know, here are the key uh, ways that have been proposed to solve energy functions of this type. Let's run them on normal computer vision problems and see which ones perform the best. And so um, that's really nice. So there's lots of um, you know usable code here that's worth looking at. I don't know. Um, yeah, these these results are not. Uh, but here you can see, for example, you know this this includes an implementation of what we just talked about, which is max product belief propagation. But there are other things too. So I encourage you to take a look at this. This is Middlebury MRF uh, data sets. Okay. So the second thing I want to talk about is a slightly different way of looking at the matting problem, okay? Um, but it's also kind of an interesting concept, and that's called random walk matting. And again, this is kind of a nice... Um, intuitive algorithm, and it's also useful, I think, from the perspective of um, other computer vision algorithms that use a similar approach to setting up a problem. And so, kind of the idea is that 
again, let's set up that I have a um, you know, foreground region that's labeled and a background region that's labeled. And here I am at this pixel, and I want to estimate alpha here. Okay. And so the original setup for this algorithm was that alpha, this is originally proposed by a researcher named Grady. So Grady kind of hypothesized that this alpha could be construed as the probability that a random walker arrives at a foreground pixel before a background pixel. And this is basically kind of like averaged over all possible paths. So kind of what I mean by that is that, you know, I don't know if you guys know what a random walk is, but the basic idea is that, you know, I start at this pixel that I'm trying to figure out, right? And then at every step, I take either a step, you know, side to side or forward or backward, right? So I'm basically making these, you know, random steps. And, you know, after I step enough, right? So, I mean, if I make a bunch of, you know, steps, I may loop back on myself. But eventually, I'm going to land in, you know, either the foreground or the background, right? So this is the instance of one random set of steps. Um, another set of steps may look like this. Another set of steps may look, look like this, and so on, right? So kind of what I'm doing is I'm counting, you know, what is the probability that I end up in foreground rather than background, okay? Now, um, I'm not just, so the other, the other kind of interesting thing about this algorithm is it's not just like I am randomly stepping every time. Otherwise, you know, the random, otherwise the probability of landing in F versus in B wouldn't be guided by the image colors at all, right? So the idea is that the, the random steps, um, the random steps probabilities are um, weighted by image, you know, color similarity. So what I mean is that, you know, if say I'm at a blue pixel and I have in front of me, you know, blue, light blue, and over here I've got yellow and behind me I've got red. Well, the idea is that I should be more inclined to step in directions that are similar to the pixel that I'm at, the color that I'm at now, right? So the idea is I don't want to cross image edges when I take the walk, right? I want to walk in the easy direction, right? Which means walking along similar colored pixels, right? And so how does that actually kind of work? That's kind of like saying that, um, you know, say, let's assume that I'm kind of in a grayscale world right now. So you say, here, here are my neighbors. So let's say that my, um, you know, my, so let's imagine that I, can measure, that I can measure similarity between pixels. This could just be like the sum of squares of RGB values normalized to 0, 1. And so let's say, for example, that my uh, similarity to this guy is 0 0.1, and my similarity to this guy is 0 0.2, and to this guy is 0 0.8, and to this guy is 0 0.7. Or maybe to make this easier, let's say 0 0.9. That way the number's in. So this is kind of like saying, okay, well, you know, how would this happen? This might happen if there was like an image edge that was separating this pixel from these guys, right? That would mean that on, you know, on my side of the edge, these guys have similar colors to me. On the other side of the edge, these guys don't have similar colors to me. So when I walk, so when I take my walk, I should be reluctant to step over the edge. This, this, you know, these numbers are low; they're not zero, so it's not impossible that I decide to, stick to jump over the edge, but it's very unlikely, right? And so, kind of what I could say is, okay, you know, the probability that I go east would be something like, you know, 0 0.9 over the sum of these other guys, right? So if I, if I do this math, this would be like saying I have a 45% chance if I'm at this pixel of going east, and then I have a lower chance of going south, and then I have a very low chance of going north or west, right? And this kind of encapsulates this idea that my uh, alpha values at similar colored pixels should be similar, right? That's kind of what we're getting at, is that 
the walker is you know more willing to look for similar pixels. Okay, so what we end up with is basically we end up with a weight w i j between each pair of adjacent pixels. Okay. And what I can do is I can gather all those weights together into a big matrix. Okay. And so I can gather all the weights together. So kind of how this looks is that, um, you know, let's say that pixel, uh, mm, I should have thought about this better. Let's say that pixel uh, 10 is adjacent to something like this, right? So, you know, if I number my pixels, one through, you know, number of pixels that I have, you know, here, that's like saying, okay, for row 10, I'm going to have four places where I'm going to add in the weights, okay? And so in columns 4, 9, 10, 11, and 16, I'm going to have a number here, and these four numbers are basically going to be uh, the weights. Actually, they're going to be the negative of the weights. This is like saying, you know, the negative of the weight 10 comma 4, and this is going to be like the negative of the weight uh, 10 comma 16. And I'm also going to have a number here in the 10 comma 10 row, which is going to be the sum of all the weights. So basically, this is just a kind of a special matrix that has exactly five entries per row. It contains the weights, the negatives of the weights on the off diagonal, and it contains the sum of all the weights in the row of on the on the diagonal. Okay, and so this here is a well-known kind of matrix that comes again from graph theory problems. And this, you say, oh, why did you call this L? You called the thing last time L. So the reason I call it L is it is also a kind of Laplacian. So this is called the graph Laplacian. And so the idea here is that um, I have five uh, non-zero entries per row. And so this means that the matrix is sparse. Sparse means that the matrix has lots and lots of zeros. It's mostly zeros, except for occasional non-zero elements. Okay. So why did I set up this whole matrix in the first place? Well, it turns out. And this is, again, one of those places where I'm not going to fill in the details because they're fairly mathematical. But the exciting thing is that uh, it turns out that the desired uh, random walker probabilities solve minimize alpha transpose alpha like this. And so this is actually kind of a surprising result. So I'll put a little exclamation point like in chess notation. So basically, you know, it seems initially that this should be like totally untractable, you know, in intractable. So it seems like, you know, how could I possibly figure out the alpha because I'm looking at an infinite number of possible ways that the random walker could go, right? I could never compute all those paths, right? But this is where there are some really nice results from graph theory to say, hey, actually, it turns out that if you form this matrix, you can actually find this, you know, uh, 
this value explicitly, right? This is actually the very same kind of problem that we talked about uh, last time for closed formatting, right? So this is actually, you know, really good news. Um, and so I should step back and say, well, you know, what would prevent me from just saying alpha equals zero, and that should minimize everything because then the alpha transpose lambda alpha is zero. Well, again, that's where the, the tri map or the scribbles come in because there I have explicitly constrained things. And so basically um, preventing um, alpha equals zero from being a solution, we know alpha equals zero or one at some set of scribble or trimap pixels. And again, this kind of plays the role of this kind of like known set. This is like the known set K. And so kind of what you do is that you look at the Laplacian, this big Laplacian here, and you say, hey, you know, actually, I know that these pixels here are foreground and these pixels here are background. And if I look at, you know, these are the corresponding columns. And so what I would do is I would say, hey, actually, what if I were to just relabel these pixels so that um, I stack all the foreground and background pixels up into the up, up, upper left-hand corner of the matrix? So I could also say, okay, I'm just gonna kind of push all these guys over to say, okay, all you foreground and background pixels, I'm gonna relabel the pixels so these guys are all in the upper left-hand corner. What I end up doing is I kind of have a part of the Laplacian that is known pixels and a part of the Laplacian is unknown pixels and then I have some other pieces of matrix here and it turns out that then minimizing alpha transpose L alpha turns into a system that looks like this where I have something like this where again this is basically uh, the unknown values And this LU and this negative RT come from the pieces of the uh, Laplacian matrix after I reorder them. And these alphas are either, you know, zero or one kind of from scribbles. And so it's actually a homework problem, not one that I assigned you guys, but kind of showing if I rearrange things, how do I go from that original minimization down to this? And this is the case where, again, this is a system now I can solve directly. So this made a little bit of a wave when it first came out, when people were talking about, hey, you know, this is a pretty clever idea. And it also, it turns out to be very easy to solve, right? You just form this Laplacian, you solve this linear system, and you're done, right? So life is good. Um, people then observed that actually, you know, um, yes, the, this is a nice idea, but the L that you use that kind of says how similar pixels are to other pixels is kind of heuristic, kind of arbitrary, right? So um, now kind of what people would do is say, okay, um, so the original formulation is kind of like not really based on kind of matting theory, right? Because there's really no, like the matting equation doesn't appear in any of that derivation, right? And really, it seems like it should. So uh, basically, modifications, you know, a key modification was to, um, let's see, modifications. One is to replace this graph Laplacian with the uh, matting Laplacian we talked about last time. Right, so remember that we talked about if you make this assumption 
that pixels share, have, you know, have this color line assumption being satisfied, well then we derived, or showed how you could derive this concept of a matting Laplacian, right? Which was again, a big matrix L, you know, also kind of like similar structure, um, but all the entries in that matrix L came from things that involved the matting equation, right? And the idea was that the affinities, you know, the entries in that matrix L kind of represented the similarity between pixels in a way that was really very specific for the batting problem. And so the idea was, hey, you know, you've got this great idea about how to minimize this. Why don't we just swap out the, you know, L from the random walker with your closed formatting L? And it turns out that also works really well. And it makes a lot more sense for the batting problem. Um, another modification was basically to allow uh, immediate jumps to um, the foreground or the background pixel, right? And this, this algorithm is kind of what's called robust mapping. And so a, real, a quick sketch of that is that, again, if I imagine that um, here's kind of a 3D version of my um, foreground and background, so here basically this is like the image plane lying flat, right? So kind of what's happening is that, again, my picture before was that at every step, this random walker is walking around, and eventually it ends up here, right? And that walk is walking around in the image plane. The other modification was that what I do is I could say, hey, you know, here's this, you know, canonical node F, and here's this canonical node B, foreground and background. And at every step, not only do I have a probability of walking in the image, but I could also basically immediately jump right to background, or I could immediately jump right to foreground, right? So in some sense, what I'm doing is I'm short-circuiting the Wander Walker's kind of slow and steady pace to hit one of these foreground and background scribbles. Instead, I'm saying, hey, you know, you can go right to foreground, you can go back right to background at every step with a certain probability. And then what I have to do is I have to, you know, I must um, assign a weight, you know, like for example, in addition to um, in addition to basically jumping between adjacent pixels, I also have to say, hey, you know, you also have a probability of going right to the foreground, right to the background at every step. And again, that part gets a little bit grungy about how they how they, how they came up with those weights. It kind of again comes from the fact that you know, for a pixel that is really similar to an existing scribble, for example, or really close to the border of a foreground or background scribble, I may have that weight be fairly high. And that kind of comes from some sort of like prior model for how good something is foreground or background. So I don't want to get into that um, a whole lot. And actually, I do want to kind of defer this in some sense to next time. So next time we're going to talk about this kind of graph cut based segmentation and this kind of concept of a graph where we can either, you know, go right to foreground, right to back. We're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail next time. Um, okay, so what else do I want to say about this? You know, it's not actually that much different than minimizing um, this robust matting equation here, where again, you know, what, what I do is I also kind of add one canonical pixel. This pixel is like known foreground, and this pixel is like known background. So it's kind of like I'm adding two rows and two columns to this big Laplacian matrix. I'm just making another set of probabilities that I could jump to those nodes. So it's not like a big modification to that algorithm. Okay, so let me just see. So like I said, the secret sauce in a lot of these equations, or a lot of these algorithms is how do I come up with the um, write foreground and background samples that I use to get intermediate estimates of alpha and so on. And so there's kind of a cool algorithm. Um, and let me see here if this is uh, online. Oops. Soft scissors at rock bottom prices. It's not what I want. I want this. Okay, so let's see if this video will play. So here the idea is that the user is scribbling along or stroking along the side of this dog and in real time the algorithm is figuring out 
what foreground and background samples to use. So it's pretty slick. And so, actually, we can watch this. I mean, I'm going to kind of narrate. I don't have the sound right on here. So this is kind of like an older algorithm like that you might get in a very early version of Photoshop where you're kind of dragging around. You know, this is about as good as you could do. And you notice this is like a kind of a hard segmentation, and you're missing all the dog fuzz. And it's taking the user forever, right? 62 seconds, and you get this kind of crummy dog outline. Um, here, this is the generation of the trimap that we were talking about, right? So here, the user is only filling in the part that they don't know, and then they're doing like a flood fill on the inside and the outside. And again, this shows that the trimap generation is kind of a tedious process. And after this, they get this dog map, which again has some errors in it. And what are we doing now? I think that now we are filling in pieces of the map that weren't so good. So. This is the cool part, right? So basically, this is real time. So they're basically dragging their mouse around the outline of the dog. And the uh, kind of, what's the word? Like the width of this circle, this kind of translucent circle that you see, is being estimated on the fly for kind of how fuzzy the object is, right? So basically, it's saying, OK, well, if my alpha estimates are bad inside of this region, I better widen out my unknown region because I think that I, you know, I don't want to call that foreground or background. So, um, Everything on the kind of blue side of the line is estimated as pure background. Everything on the red side of the line is estimated as pure foreground. And those are used to seed the foreground and background samples. And what you're seeing here is not like, um, you know, this is like really happening real time. And you can also see they're, they're showing what happens if you recomposite the dog, I think, on a different background on the fly. So you're basically kind of seeing how well is this going to look on a new background, right? Now you fill in the dog and like, you know, suddenly it pops in pretty well, right? Apparently this is like a dog segmentation kind of uh, paper here. And I think, I could be wrong, but I mean, I think some of these authors uh, now work at Photoshop and so it's possible, I haven't used like the most recent version of Photoshop, but it's possible this may actually be in, you know, the most recent release of Photoshop. That was actually one of the questions on the homework is, see if you can find another matting algorithm to test against. And so um, this soft scissors paper has been around for a few years. And so hopefully there is implementation of it out somewhere. And so here we just kind of watch this uh, guy zipping around these fuzzy objects. Is this a cat? I guess it's a cat, yeah. I think this is a fuzzy cat. So that looks pretty good. And yes, this is kind of showing the fact that it is doing the automatic brush width. And you can see up, up at the top of the dog, it's narrow, and up at the side of the dog, it's smooth. It'll be interesting to see. I'm not sure if they're going to show any uh, failure cases, but uh, it is pretty neat. Here is this familiar woman from uh, matting papers. You see her all the time. So it is available in Photoshop as a plugin. Okay. It's a paid plugin names. A paid plugin, you say? Yeah, Power Mask. Huh. I don't know how to use it. Oh, so here you see this is just the samples that are being generated, right? So here you see that it's building, you know, kind of samples of her face and of her uh, of the background. And so now they're going back to fix errors that the algorithm, you know, missed these flyaway wisps. And so it's got some nice, you know, again, one, one thing that's kind of not to be underestimated is the user interface to these tools, right? I think that that beginning video was very telling about how tedious it is to create a trimap, for example, even though it sounds like, oh, that doesn't sound so hard. In practice, it's kind of a pain. And so here, I guess this is just kind of showing um, your typical batting results. <laughs> Spiky gel hair guy. And again, you know, this is kind of like showing how much better this algorithm is than the Bayesian matting algorithm we talked about before, the belief propagation algorithm we talked about just earlier, the closed formatting we talked about uh, on Thursday. And knockout is an old uh, matting algorithm from the visual effects industry. Yep. 
So I think that you get the idea. So this is this is pretty slick, and I think that um, you know matting may have moved on a little bit since then, but I think this is a very nice demonstration about how far you can go. And so um, the next thing I want to talk about next time is not so much a matting algorithm as it is a hard segmentation algorithm that's going to be useful for us later on. And I can talk about how you can kind of upgrade those hard segmentations to a map. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can do uh, video mapping, which is um, definitely a uh, harder problem because you have to generate a map in every uh, frame of a video sequence. And so, okay, so let me just uh, conclude. So are there any questions about anything? Since we have a little bit of time, what I want to do is show you a couple of videos from previous course projects just to kind of get you thinking about what you might do for your, your course project. And so let me terminate this.